Well, How to Train Your Dragon 2 takes place five years later. And that means that dragons are now fully integrated into, into the lifestyle of Burke. Uh, they were enemies, now they live together, and so they've had to repurpose the island to suit that function, to make it a little more fun and a little less dangerous <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> so largely led by Hiccup, there have been all sorts of ingenious updates that make that possible. We thought what better way to reintroduce the audience to the island of Burke and all of its updates, but also reintroduce them to the character now aged five years, than to have this kinetic, visceral, obstacle race of a game that kind of flies you by all of the new updates and, and gives you kind of a, an introduction to each character and their dragon that they've been paired with um, now five years into that relationship. So in their spare time, not only have Hiccup and Toothless been pushing the limits of what's possible with flight, but they've been out there mapping the world, which has become their new hobby. And so they've taken that, that Viking map from the first movie and they've been adding pieces onto it in every direction. Every new land they find that leads to the discovery of new dragons and also new tribes uh, gets added to this map and it becomes Hiccup's um, go-to reference for, for the larger world. When we pick up with Astrid, it's now five years later, of course, and she's five years into her relationship with Hiccup. So we wanted to create the sense that these two are their pals, they are explorers, she's as much uh, a contributor to the map as Hiccup has been. Um, and they just have a, a very easygoing, very relaxed, very comfortable relationship. One of the concepts be behind the second installment was that we would not only start five years later, but we would also introduce characters that are five years older, which was a challenge for us on a design front to retain the charm and appeal of each, of each character, but give them a significant boost in age. And it was a, a bit of a kind of a trial and error process. So these five years later, now that, that uh, Hiccup is the town hero, his relationship with his dad has eased somewhat in that uh, his father is just the proudest dad that, could, you, that you could ever have. Uh, that said, He's so proud that Stoic would love to now have Hiccup succeed him as chief. And he's in the process of preparing him to finally take over that mantle and, and become the new leader of Burke in this time of peace. Uh, which sounds great, except for the fact that Hiccup loves his life of freedom and abandon and being out there mapping the world with no responsibilities. So the idea of having to grow up and become an adult is off-putting to him. and he's. He's doing everything he can to prolong it or avoid it. Well, I would say with How to Train Your Dragon uh, serving as the first act of this trilogy, we now leave behind the Viking island of Burke and we set sail for distant, uncharted lands where we will discover a conflict that is brewing uh, that threatens the peace between humans and dragons forever. And the only hope, you know, the only voice of reason is lies in our unlikely Viking hero named Hiccup and his trusty Night Fury Toothless. Well, the idea of bringing back Hiccup's mother when we kind of indicated in the first movie that she had died of unknown causes is, it's, it's a moment of, I think, deep wish fulfillment for Hiccup because Hiccup knows that he's not a carbon copy of his father and he's being asked to step into his father's shoes and feels a little uncomfortable knowing that there's this other part of his soul that pines for something more that is most comfortable when he's out there with his dragon uh, searching for a purpose. So meeting his mother and knowing that she also is a dragon whisperer and she's so accomplished in the ways of dragons and flying and knowing secrets about them and that she lives among them up in the Arctic, you know, on her own with this great purpose to her life. That revelation is deeply meaningful for Hiccup because he feels in that moment that he's found the missing half of his soul and he knows who he is finally. This installment introduces a new villain to the, to the trilogy and that is Drago Bloodvist. Stoic first describes him as somebody who is a stranger from a strange land having come to them with a very specific mission, which was 
to garner himself a dragon army so that he could suppress those who won't follow him. He presents himself as a man of the people, that he's ultimately trying to deliver them from uh, the, the oppression of dragons. But in reality, and Hiccup sees this fairly quickly, he's just acquiring a dragon enemy that he can use to his advantage. So Eret, son of Eret, was designed to be a, an interesting character in that he is, he's introduced as a threat. He is a minion of Drago Bloodvist, uh, a trapper. In fact, he declares himself the world's greatest dragon trapper. And he's a bit of a cowboy. He's very cocky. Um, he, he and his, his men occupy a trapper's fort, kind of deep in the northern reaches of, of Norway. And they have been successfully trapping dragons for Drago for some time. But Eret has kind of a misplaced loyalty in a way. There's more substance than you first allot him when you meet him. Uh, and we, we get to see that through Hiccup's influence and Astrid's influence that, that he really does come around to realizing that, that dragons are not the, uh, the commodity that he has known them to be.